was kind of a small group, but as I was, um, Ellie, as I was telling Marissa earlier, um, we have so much more participation yes. in COVID, ironically, than we even normally would. Um, we always meet the last Monday of each month with just two exceptions, really. Uh, and they, uh, I, we would generally have 20 visitors to those meetings and we would have free childcare. Um, and we'll get back to that sometime. But I think that what we may not quit are our online offerings because uh, we've had so many more people participating with us since we've had that option available to people. Um, Joe, you give me a sign when you're ready. Okay, give me just a second. That's fine. Yeah, when we um, start our meetings, we always have introductions uh, just of ourselves and we don't put those out. Um, we never have. Even uh, Joe has uh, recorded our meetings for a long time. And if anyone's interested, you can find those on our YouTube channel. Um, we have a pretty nice library there now of several years of our meetings. So, uh, and not just meetings, but our workshops. Eventually, it will fix the CC on those too. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. Melanie and Hazel, look down. You see, we she has given us I know it. captioning. That is so cool. Yeah. Okay, I see looks that. like we are live now, so okay. All uh, right. you can go ahead and I will monitor um, the live for any questions and I'll put those in the chat. Yes, and everybody who is on um, the Zoom call, um, remember that you can move your cursor to the bottom of the screen, find the reactions and put a hand if you want to raise your hand. That hand will go, that hand will go into your box and um, we'll know that you have a question. And I, I know that our speakers would love to um, know when you want to ask a question and be able to uh, respond right away. So first of all, um, uh, thanks to Melanie, we have uh, Allie, Allie Barnett, is that right? And she's from Justin's Place. And I'll let her go ahead and get started. And she's going to um, talk about uh, a hippotherapy uh, program that Justin's place is for just a few minutes before our uh, speaker for the rest of the evening. Is. Awesome, can you hear me? Yes, thanks for coming, Allie. Okay, yeah, thank you guys for inviting me. Um, I'm gonna see if I can share my screen just because pictures are always better. I feel like it might not let me and that's fine, but. I'm, I'm making sure you can do that right now. Okay. Okay, you should be able to share your screen, yes. Okay, can you guys see that? Yes. Okay, awesome. Um, so uh, Justin's Place is a therapeutic farm in Wilmore, Kentucky. And um, I like to share a little bit about like how we got started, just as I see a lot of y'all have um, children who are adults now. Um, we do specialize in children, and that's because um, Justin King was a young man who lost his life three years ago in a car wreck, and he um, had a heart for children and was really great at working with kids. And so after he passed away, his family wanted to do something to honor Justin and leave a legacy for him. They always felt like he would have done something with children and with his life, uh, and he never got the chance to do that. And so that's how Justin's Place came to be. Um, we, here we go. Our mission is to support um, extraordinary children through equine assisted services in a beautiful farm environment. Let's see if I can get that out of the way. Um, so we do specialize in children with um, Down syndrome and autistic children. Our Barn Buddies program serves children ages four to 12 with a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. Um, it provides individualized sessions for children. And we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like. Um, but basically it ends in a therapeutic writing lesson that can be 15 to 45 minutes of their session. And other than that, they get to pick 
what it is that they're most interested in and they pick their plan week to week um, if they have the capacity to do so or we can have parents assist in that as well. Um, we do 45 minute private lessons or 60 minute um, group lessons of two to three kids. And some of the activities that they can choose is therapeutic riding um, learning about our barnyard animals. So you can see our goats there. We have a mini pig and a sheep and a mini mule and mini ponies. Um, learning games, which can be very different, of course, based on the child. Some of them are just sensory play, some are matching games or actually learning equine skills. And then we have a flower and vegetable garden that kids really enjoy getting their hands around a carrot and pulling it out of the ground and feeding it to their horse. Um, or picking green beans off the vine and feeding it to the goats. Um, so we have a lot of different things uh, intentionally in hopes that we can find something that a kid's really interested in and then repeat that and use that as a learning tool. Um, some fre frequently asked questions is our cost for this is $120 per month. So that covers four or five sessions, just depending on the month. But we do have scholarships that can cover um, whatever is needed pretty much to make it affordable for the families. Um, we try to keep kids scheduled the same day and time every week with the same volunteers and the same horse, just for that consistency piece of them knowing what it's gonna be every time they come, um, they feel comfortable and familiar with their plan. We are open Sunday through Thursday from 8.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. And we book all, all hours of the day and um, every day that we're open, we've got kids out. And parent involvement is zero to 100%. So we have kids that are parents that stay in the car the whole time. We have parents that are within arm's reach and are trained volunteers. And um, so it's really just whatever's gonna work best for their kiddo. Um, so how it kind of works is you would apply for Barn Buddies on our website. I would schedule a phone chat with the parent or guardian and we would get a medical release form and then schedule a first free session, which is just no obligation, a time to come out, see the farm, see the animal, groom a pony um, and spend some time seeing, you know, what types of things your child might be interested in. Um, I do like to say we're not hippotherapy. Hippotherapy is P-T-O-T-S-T -T on the back of a horse. Um, we're not horse therapy. There's no such thing as horse therapy. We are therapeutic riding. Um, so I am actually a registered nurse, but I'm also a past certified riding instructor. And I'm sorry, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Allie Barnett, I'm the director at Justin's Place. And um, so what we've kind of found is we are for a lot of families, we're a support to the existing therapies. So a lot of kids are getting PTOTST or speech um, or behavioral therapy or ABA therapy. And we are kind of a support to those existing therapies. They wind up meeting their goals in those therapies because they've gained confidence at Justin's place. And a lot of families just want somewhere where their child can have something fun, something that's theirs and that they're good at. And so that's also a need that we serve a lot. Um, I like to say our pilot program received 10 out of 10 ratings in every category from parents. Um, so we had really good feedback and we're really excited to go into this year um, to grow our program. Uh, there's my information. That's my email and our, our website if you would like more information. We are currently enrolling and we have a couple spots left. Um, as we train more volunteers, then we'll have more spots throughout the year. Um, but if you're interested, I would love to answer any questions that you have or um, I like, I'm very interested in collaborating as well with existing services. Um, so that's kind of the program in a nutshell and what we do. I don't know if there's any questions now, but I'm happy to share anything. Allie, I'm wondering how long has it been open? Yeah, so the family um, the founding family purchased the farm in January of last year and like completely renovated it just for this purpose, which was cool because we kind of got to design the facility to be safe for this population and intentional. So that renovation completed in July. We opened in August and stayed open until Thanksgiving. So we ended with 20 kids a week. 
we're starting back, I think immediately at like 27 kids a week. So hoping to grow. Um, do this is how many volunteers do you have participating? Um, how many volunteers do we have participating? Right now we have 50 trained volunteers and we do about, I train about 10 to 12 every month. Um, we have on a typical busy week about 20 volunteers that come out like consistently. And what do the volunteers do? They work with the kids or with the animals? Both. Um, so during riding lessons, we have a leader who is in charge of the horse. And then we have a side walker who is in charge of the child, basically just safety delegation and um, helping that child stay engaged and remain safe under the supervision of myself as the instructor. Um, and that side walker also kind of serves as like an aid when they're not riding. They're also helping them with the learning game or whatever activity it is that we're doing. Awesome. Allie, this is Mel. Um, is there a weight limit in terms of the individual as far as being able to ride? Yes. Um, you know, I actually have two new horses that just came this week. So I think our previous existing weight limit was at 180. Um, but I'm not sure that might actually be a little bit higher with these new guys. I haven't done their weight measurement yet. So okay. remind me what, what's the age range? Yes. It's four to 12. Um, and for our four-year-olds don't ride they just come out and do they get assigned a mini horse and do everything else and then whenever they turn five then they're able to ride for safety regulations oh cool do you think you'll take adults down the road <laughs> we've had a lot of interest of course <laughs> for older um that's why I gave the backstory because you know the founding family again created this to carry on Justin's legacy so they were pretty specific and they want to serve children and okay. um, but I don't think that anything's out of the question I think we hope to expand in the future <laughs> um but I don't know where it'll take us what I'm curious about is there are quite a few young people with uh, autism who like to work with animals and so you know it'd be great to see them as volunteers or workers or uh, however you want to design it. So that's an idea you might want to think about for the future. Yes. And I actually um, had some interest from the Down Syndrome Central Kentucky Association as well regarding like an internship. Oh um, and so I'm definitely interested in that. And I would love like your all's input on what would make that a successful program. You know, what types of things would you be looking for for those individuals to make it fun and successful for yeah. them. So I would love input when it comes to that as well. Allie on Facebook Live, Cherokee Nicole Smith says she's been following you guys on Facebook and has been meaning to look into this. Wants to know, how do you decide if group or individual lessons are best? Really, it's up to the parent. Um, I completely understand if you feel like your child would function best in a 45 minute private. Um, like if you don't feel that being with another child would be as beneficial as them being alone. A lot of our kids start private and then switch to a group a couple months in once they get comfortable. Um, it's really up to the parent. If you say that you want a private, we'll try to make it you know, work for a private lesson. And um, for our groups, I do try to keep it just two at a time. And I just kind of group it on similar um, level of ability and interest of writing. And then it's gone, that's gone pretty well so far. Um, and they, they do get their one on one time in the group as well. So. Is anybody else on Zoom call or on Facebook Live have any questions? I just have a comment. I think the idea of them working in groups and taking care of the animals and riding and building relationships with each other is really good for this group because it's hard for them to make friends. So this is a good opportunity for them to do just a little bit more than working with the animals. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good you. point, Kazel. You, we could you here. Here we're thinking of ideas for you, Allie. Um, there could be a social skills group. 
<laughs> this somehow incorporates the horses. Sorry. Yeah, actually, um, like I said, they, they work on goals and stuff. And a lot of them, that is a goal, is the social skill component, which they get um, just with their volunteers, that two-way communication with their volunteers. Um, and when there is another peer, when they, there's a lot of parallel play, I guess. So he's grooming his horse, he's grooming his horse. And so it's like, oh, what are you doing? Oh, your horse stop. You know, it creates a lot of opportunity for social skills. I think naturally just how it kind of is set up. So that's cool. Okay, did anyone else have any questions? Okay, Allie, thanks so much. I'm Thank glad you. to hear about it. It's news to me and I'm sure it is to a lot of other people. Uh, a lot of people will see this later on tonight or in the coming days and learn more about it. Thank you guys for the opportunity. Well, thanks for coming. And you're welcome to stay or go, whichever you'd like to do. And anybody um, is always, our meetings are always open. You're, you're uh, open to anybody who would like to join always. So thanks for coming. Okay. Um, I'll get started then with, um, we're going to hear from Marissa Webb. Our main topic for tonight is um, housing and emotional support animals. Um, I'll give her bio, which you all may have seen in our uh, flyer, but originally from Texas, Marissa went to Scott County High School in Georgetown, Kentucky, and has since stayed in the Bluegrass State. She graduated from Western Kentucky University with honors, with a Bachelor of Arts in History and Political Science, with a concentration in Legal Studies. She served as a founding member of the Hilltopper Organization of Latin American Students at WKU and worked to provide a voice to the growing Latinx group there, voice there. Um, Marissa is excited to work with the Human Rights Commission and serve the Lexington Fayette Urban County. So Marissa, thanks for being here. We appreciate thank you. it. Thank you for that introduction and thank you, Ali. Um, I had never heard of that and that was a really, really cool program. So thank you for um, easing me into this meeting with your wonderful presentation. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen as well. And I'll go ahead and start my presentation. Excellent. So um, I'll briefly talk about who I am and what I do, um, and then we'll get to what we'll be talking about today, which is fair housing and disability as a protected class. So I am the housing investigator for the Human Rights Commission of Lexington, Kentucky. So that means that if you bring forth a complaint, a case of discrimination um, dealing with housing, I will be your investigator. I'll be the one um, who will conduct a fact-finding investigation. And what that means is that we take this neutral stance and we will hear from you and the complaint as the complainant, and then we will reach out to the respondent. While we conduct our investigation, this means gathering documents, gathering comparatives, and also conducting interviews. So I just don't deal with housing, although I deal with um, all the housing within Lexington. I also uh, conduct investigations concerning employment and public accommodation. Now under civil rights laws, um, both federally and um, here locally, you can bring forth a complaint of discrimination in regards to housing based upon race, sex, age. Oh. Sorry, do you have a question? I wanna make sure that this is interactive. Um, so if you do have a question, feel free to put it in the chat or speak up. Um, I have a couple scenarios as we'll be going through this presentation. So we will be hopefully having a dialogue about, um, about housing and housing discrimination. Um, so familial status is another protected class, disability of course, and sexual orientation, gender identity um, is a protected class here within Lexington under our local ordinances. 
So that means that if you fall into one of these categories, which everybody does and can, you can bring forth a complaint of discrimination. Um, you can, uh, our process is free with the, in the Human Rights Commission. So as long as you believe that there has been a harm done to you, you will be able to bring forth a complaint. So fair housing laws, the broad overview. Um, the first piece of civil rights legislation um, was actually 1866, um, right after the Civil War. And then there have been several, um, the Civil Rights Act, 1968, the uh, Title III of Americans with Disabilities Act, Kentucky Civil Rights Act, and our local ordinance pertaining to here in Lexington. Now, let's talk about um, federal disability rights laws. There are a couple, um, there are four, and the main one we'll be talking about is fair housing because that's the one that um, I'm the most knowledgeable about. That's the one that we bring forth complaints of discrimination. However, I do think that it is important to be aware of the other laws um, that potentially could pertain to you and uh, could um, help you fall back on as reference. So we have the Architectural Barriers Act. Um, this is regarding certain buildings to be accessible with those with a disability, uh, specifically if it's constructed or leased by the US. So these are government buildings. Um, if a building was constructed with a grant or loan from the United States. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Um, this is regarding uh, federal financial assistance. So, if you're a recipient of federal financial assistance, um, then this act pertains to you. This means that 5% of your total units must be fully accessible to those with a mobility impairment, or 2% of the, or sorry, and 2% of the total units must be fully accessible to those with a sensory impairment. And of course, the ADA, the Americans with Disability Act. There are two parts of this act that um, particularly pertain to housing, um, Title II, which pertains to public entities, activities operated by state and local government, including housing, and Title III, which is case of a public accommodation associated with housing. So this could be um, if you are in an apartment complex and there is a lobby, that lobby has to be fully accessible. Um, and then of course, the Fair Housing Act. That's what we're going to be talking about the most today um, because it is the act that I bring fair housing complaints up for. So um, disability was added to the Fair Housing Act September 13th, 1988. Um, so a few years before the ADA and disability as, as defined under the Fair Housing Act includes individuals with a mental or physical impairment that substantially limits one or more life function or activity. So a life function, um, it can be considered walking, hearing, seeing, breathing, performing manual tasks, caring for oneself, learning, etc. cetera. Um, it also protects a person with a history or record of such impairment. So if you, um, let's say you had um, cancer, and uh, you were, you had successfully beaten the cancer. However, if um, there was a record of that and your housing provider did discriminate you and you felt like your housing provider was discriminating against you based upon that history, then you would be able to file a complaint within our office. It also can include somebody perceived as having a disability as well. So um, disability covers almost all housing, or sorry, uh, disability under the Fair Housing Act covers almost all housing, public and private. This is different from some of those um, federal laws that I talked about before, the ADA section 504, um, in that they're very particular to uh, housing that is, you know, part of um, government federal funding. 
Under the Fair Housing Act, it can be brought, a complaint can be brought against your private landlord. The Act Accessibilities Requirement also applies to covered multifamily housing. So this is when I said it covers almost all housing. There are a few exemptions, but for pretty much almost all multifamily housing, you're covered under the Fair Housing Act. Now, design and construction for first occupancy, this is something that um, is, uh, I'm saying an exemption. So if you do have, let's say a mobility impairment um, and you are going through the apartment complex, you're there to determine, do I wanna live here? Do I wanna rent here? And you notice that perhaps the light switches are not ADA accessible, they aren't low enough, um, they are just too high. What are some of your options? Well, unfortunately, if the apartment was constructed, if the building was constructed for first occupancy before this March 13th, 1991 deadline, um, unfortunately, they are not covered um, as having to be designed and constructed um, to meet ADA accessible requirements. Now, if it's a brand new apartment complex, um, just got done building and you go and you notice it's not accessible, then you would be able to bring forth a complaint underneath this, um, underneath design and construction. So covered multifamily housing. It includes all of the units in the building containing four or more units with an elevator. All ground floor units in the building containing um, four or more units without an elevator. And I see that there's some things in the chat. Let's see if I can get to it. Yes, okay, so I see here, I have a question. What about an apartment building that advertises being accessible? Um, even built prior to that date of 1991. Okay, so this is an excellent question. Um, and underneath the Fair Housing Act, so regarding design and construction, um, it probably you probably would not be able to bring forth a complaint alleging discrimination um, because it's after that date, that 1991 date. However, um, you can. Uh, bring forth a complaint of discriminatory statements um, that is protected under the Fair Housing Act in advertising. Discriminatory advertising is also protected under the Fair Housing Act. So what that means is that um, if you see an advertisement that alleges um, being accessible and you get there and it's not accessible, you may be able to bring forth um, a complaint of discrimination underneath that section of the Fair Housing Act. Um, courts have ruled that just talking about the um, about the property is a form of advertisement. So it doesn't just have to be in print advertisement. It can be verbal um, as well. So that is considered advertisement under the Fair Housing Act, which if, even if you there are some caveats to those exemptions if you are advertising. Um, now, if you, another thing I want to say about advertising is that if you see, um, I'll say an ad that says, we're really, um, this is a great apartment complex for those who are active. That on its face, it didn't say, you know, I don't want anybody with a wheelchair living here. However, um, it could be because they're implying we want active people. It could be that they are projecting um, who they want to reside on the property. And that is advertising, even if they just say it, if it's in print, even better. Um, and that would be able to bring forth a complaint of discrimination under what we do. Great question. Okay, so we'll talk about some scenarios. Um, I can see that um, some of you are muted. So if you wanna remain muted, that's fine. Um, and we'll just kinda, I'll talk it out amongst myself, but I definitely wanna give you all a chance to speak up and let me know what you think. So I know that this isn't totally pertaining to um, maybe what I'm here for tonight. However, this does get into the definition of 
who is considered to have a disability under the Fair Housing Act. So I do think it's important to touch on it real quick. Um, is a drug addiction considered a disability under the Fair Housing Act? And you can put in the chat too, if you think yes, no. Marissa, I, this is Melanie. I, I would say yes, that would be considered. And I, it's a guess, <laughs> so I might be wrong. It's a good guess. Oh. It's a good guess. So yes, having a drug addiction is considered a disability under the Fair Housing Act. Um, so excellent, excellent guess. Um, if an individual is currently using, however, um, do we think it's still considered a disability? I'll go ahead and, and give that one to you all. Um, and actually what um, the Fair Housing Act says is that if you do have an addiction, it is considered a disability as long as you are seeking treatment. Now, what exactly that means is a little in the gray area. You know, if you are on day one of sobriety, um, are you seeking treatment? You know, are you, or are you on day one sobriety every other day? Um, However, if you do um, have an addiction, you are considered um, to be an individual with a disability under the Fair Housing Act. So alcoholism, considered a disability. And, my, oh, yes. My, my guess is yes, under the same scenarios. Exactly. Yes, exactly right. Um, if you're on day one of sobriety, um, that's something, you know, as long as you are seeking treatment. So that could be in a multitude of avenues. It could be with therapy. It could be with um, groups such as NAAA. Um, however, it is considered a disability. However, the Fair Housing Act does not protect those who are deemed and considered a threat to others. So mm -hmm. that is a specific part of um, disability under the Fair Housing Act that I just want to remind individuals of. So let's talk about um, modifications and accommodations. Now, anybody can bring forth a complaint of fair housing um, discrimination saying, you know, I believe that, for example, repairs, I believe my neighbor's repairs are getting done much quicker than my repairs are being done. And I think part of the reason for that is because um, I have a disability and um, they just don't want to come and conduct repairs. We can absolutely investigate those kinds of complaints, and we do. However, most of the complaints that I see coming through my office regarding um, an individual with a disability, and if they're bringing forth a complaint alleging disability discrimination, sometimes it falls into these categories, modifications versus accommodations. So modifications are typically not a policy change. Typically, they are something physical. This could be grab bars. This could be ensuring that there is um, room underneath the sink should you be in a wheelchair. This could be ensuring that the outlets and the plugs are in accessible reach. Accommodations are policy changes. So this could be a parking spot if your apartment complex does not have assigned parking. This could be an emotional support animal. Um, this could also be, let's say, if your rent is due on the first. However, just covering way more than emotional support. Yeah, <laughs> I, I hope that's okay. No, that's really good. Okay. Well, don't worry. We'll definitely get to the emotional support um, animals um, as we start talking about these accommodations. Oh, I didn't. I didn't mean to interrupt. you I, I was really liking that. I like. I like the broad, the breadth of what you're covering. Oh, good. Yeah, and please tell me if you. Um, if you need me to clarify something else or um, if you want more information about something mm -hmm. that maybe um, isn't just emotional support animal related and I'll definitely do my best to try and answer them. Great, that's awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so an accommodation request could also be such as um, if your rent's due on the first of the month, however, you use a portion of 
Um, if you get a disability check and you use a portion of that money amount to pay for the rent, and if that doesn't come until the third of the month, then you can explain, you know, I'm asking for this policy change because of my disability. Um, and when you file a complaint with, within our office, um, while we need to know, you know, are you a covered individual? Do you have a disability that is covered under the Fair Housing Act? That's not something that we disclose to the respondent, to your landlord, to the housing provider. So we would not tell them, you know, the disability is X. Um, rather, we would just say that the complaint is based upon a disability. So those are the two differences. We'll touch on modifications first, and then we'll get into those accommodations, such as those ESAs. So in a, multi, a covered multifamily housing, the tenant has the right to make a reasonable modification to the property um, if it is necessary for the person's full use and enjoyment of the premise. That's the actual language that's in there. So again, that full use and enjoyment, that could be, um, you know, I need to get to my, I need to actually get into my apartment and their steps and because I'm in a wheelchair, you know, I'm unable to to go up those steps. I need a ramp. There are certain limitations. Now, modifications are on a case by case basis. So this means that the housing provider may require the tenant to restore the property to its prior condition when it is reasonable to do so. So this means like um, for example, it cannot interfere with the next tenant's use or enjoyment of it. And it does not have to be restored to the complete original conditions. Um, it just has to be that full and enjoyment use of that property. So let's say if it is that ramp example, um, an individual could, a landlord could say, actually, I don't need it to be restored I don't need the ramp to be taken off and the steps to be put back um, because even an individual who does not have a mobility dis disability impairment, they can still walk up the ramp. It's pretty much the same. Um, so the landlord may also say, no, I, I do want the steps. All of the other apartments have steps. I want this one to have steps. Um, and the tenant would then be asked to restore the property. Um, back to that original, to those original steps. Now in private housing, um, this is where it gets different. So in private housing, the tenant is responsible for that payment of the modification of the premises. In public housing and certain HUD financed housing, so if you do receive federal funding, um, HUD or the landlord may actually have to pay for that modification. So Something to remember with modification is that because you're asking for this modification, that does not mean that your landlord then can say, well, I'm going to increase your security deposit because I know I'm going to have to spend money taking that ramp away. They're not allowed to do that. Um, but the housing provider may require, so if you say you can have the ramp, me as the tenant, I may have to be required to show documentation. You know, this isn't my uncle placing this ramp in. This is a hired professional. This is the day that they're coming. These are the materials being used. A landlord may ask for that information. They may not. However, um, it is something if you as a tenant or you as a housing provider, if you are one, um, may want to be aware of and, and know that, um, depending on what it is you can ask for to ensure that the work is completed especially when it comes to something such as um, hand bars in a shower or hand bars in a toilet a near toilet you know these could be things that you want to ensure i want to make sure it's done right you know i don't want there to potentially be a hazard with the drywall um i need to make sure that that they're in fact installing this on load bearing walls um, so those are certain things that you as a tenant or you as a landlord or you just perhaps relaying this information to a friend or a loved one want to know, you know, you may be asked, I want to make sure that this is done professionally. Can you provide me with that assurance? 
Um, additionally, a landlord may say, um, and this is something that we've seen, is that a landlord says, um, we can provide you with a ramp. However, you're asking for a concrete ramp and we think that'll be really expensive. So what about a wood ramp? Um, it, you know, that may be deemed more reasonable. And that actually brings us right into our next scenario, which is um, if I request a ramp from my landlord and she wants to put in a wooden ramp, I want a concrete ramp. Um, I'm afraid it may get too slippery, slippery when it rains. I'm paying for the modification. It's a private housing. Um, shouldn't I be able to choose the ramp that I want? I wish I had a little. I, I, my, me, <laughs> I would guess that the landlord does have some leeway in what they are required to provide, as long as it fits in certain parameters like safety, that they are not required to do just anything, any gold plated ramp. <laughs> would that be yeah, right? That's exactly right. I tend to right. agree with that. Anybody else? I agree with that because. Uh, when you if the landlord has to be the one who spends that money, there's no way that he can recoup those losses, and that person may not live there forever. That's not their forever home. So, yes, that is exactly correct. Um, you know, if the potential tenant, me, if I'm worried about it becoming too slippery, you know, the landlord may suggest, well, we'll put you know grip strips down to ensure that it does not become too slippery. Um, the, it also could pertain to potential cost of removing it too. The landlord may say, you know, unfortunately, you know, a concrete ramp, we're afraid that it may um, potentially alter the, the entire entrance of, into the unit. Um, whereas we know if it's a wooden ramp, it, it may not be able to be as big of a liability. So uh, the landlord does have a little bit of um, say in what they can choose to accept or not to accept. However, it does have to be, it does have to serve the purpose of the modification, which in this case, of course, is mobility. Now, if it's a HUD subsidized property, it is um, exactly the same as you said. The only difference would be that HUD would then be paying or the federal government and the landlord would then be paying for that modification um, rather than the actual tenant. Um, but yes, exactly the same answer as above. Um, they are able to say, no, we think structurally the wooden ramp um, would be better for our property and serves the same purpose as a concrete ramp. Now, reasonable accommodations. So, this means that an individual with a disability potentially can be excluded from requires that the housing providers make reasonable accommodations within these policies and rules to ensure that an, indiv an individual with a disability has that equal opportunity to apply and has that full enjoyment of the premises. These are where these mod accommodations come in. Modifications dealt with physically altering the property, a ramp, grab bars. Modifications, it's an adjustment to the policy. Typically, though not always, um, accommodations do not require a monetary amount. They don't require the building of the ramp. They don't require um, this money to be attached to potential work to be done on the property. Rather, it's just that policy change. So to obtain a reasonable accommodation, the applicant or the tenant has the responsibility. So it first lays upon this applicant or this tenant to ask for the accommodation needed. Um, but once that housing, uh, or sorry, once that tenant asks that housing provider, I need an accommodation due to my disability, the housing provider must then work with the applicant or the tenant to create a accommodation that's reasonable and suits the applicant's or tenant's needs. 
unless it is financially or administ an administrative burden. So once the tenant, once the individual, the, the individual with a disability um, ha has taken that step of requesting that accommodation, there has to be that dialogue. It has to be, you know, the if the landlord housing provider just says, nope, we're not doing it, sorry. That seems like a pretty clear cut um, example of housing discrimination based upon disability. They need to be in that dialogue. Okay, explain to me this accommodation. Or, you know, sometimes such as an ESA animal, it's, you know, I know that there's no pet policy. However, this is my emotional support animal that I need to be, it needs to be stay here and reside with me. It doesn't cost them anything. It's just a change to the policy. But again, it has to be practical and feasible. So it doesn't change the basic nature of the housing program. Um, we've seen individuals who have come forth and explained, you know, in years past, um, maybe there are something such as transportation that was provided by the housing provider. Um, and the housing provider eventually said, no, sorry, we're not a taxi service. Um, we really need to focus more on spending our money on the housing itself. Um, an accommodation such as, you know, restoring that kind of transportation needs, um, that may change the nature of the housing program. That may be extreme, an extreme financial burden to pay for the car, gas, insurance, et cetera, or an administrative burden. If the property manager is not in the in the house in the office for the property, but instead they are um, you know, taking individuals, driving individuals back and forth, um, then they may not be there to be able to conduct their administrative needs. And I should say that when the, if the housing provider does say, no, I'm sorry, but we, um, we cannot meet that accommodation, that burden is on the housing provider to explain how it is an undue financial or administrative burden, or that it changes the nature of the housing program. Okay, another scenario. My apartment complex is a policy that only tenants can do their laundry in the facilities. I have a mobility impairment and use a motorized chair. As a result, all the laundry machines are inaccessible. I requested an accommodation of one of my friends who's coming over to help assist with the laundry. Does my landlord have to grant the accommodation? What do we think? I wish there was a way to do a poll. That way I could see yes or no. You don't need to do that. There is a way to do a poll. Give me just oh, a second there? and I will do it for you. Um, what was oh, okay. the question? I think I have three more scenarios after this. So yeah, yes or no. Okay, um, yes or no for? For all of them, I believe, but definitely for this one. Okay, what's the question? Um, does my landlord have to grant an accommodation um, to allow my friend to be able to use the laundry facility. Okay, just a second. I'm almost I think there. yes, because because if you have a disability and you need accommodations and you have a worker who provides such accommodations, then the worker ought to be able to use the facilities. They help you as long as they're not using it for themselves. Is the person getting paid to, to um, provide assistance? Um, it is not, it's just their friend, friend. Um, okay. coming over. So it's not like a, um, a, somebody who is potentially serving in a caregiving role, okay. just a friend. Okay. 
I'm How many guessing. people do we have on the Zoom right now? <laughs> um, one, two, three, oh. four, five, six, seven. I submitted my answer. Maybe that helps. Eight. Eight? Okay, we have all the votes in. Okay, great. That's the person polling. I'm not allowed to vote, but I say no. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I say. So um, I would say if somebody came to me and they explained that this was the accommodation that they requested, um, does the landlord have to grant that accommodation? I would see it as yes. It's a reasonable accommodation request. Um, they aren't fundamentally changing the need of the actual housing provider. They aren't changing that. Um, and it's not cost effective or an administrative burden. Um, the individual, myself, um, as the person um, who the laundry machines are inaccessible for, um, I, uh, you know, I'm asking my friend to come over. It's not as if my friend is conducting my laundry and their laundry. They're just helping me with mine. Um, so I would see it as this is an accessible, this is a, um, a reasonable accommodation request. And I would see that, you know, even if, um, even if the rules are that only tenants can use their laundry services, I would say that this is a reasonable pretty reasonable accommodation request. Before I continue, I saw a couple of questions in the chat, such as would um, accessible light switches also mean high contrast for individuals who are legally blind? Um, this is, yes. So um, if you are, oh, well, let me first ask um, a little bit about it, this. So if this is, um, if you're saying, you know, I'm requesting these high contrast um, light switches because I am legally blind, um, then absolutely. Um, this could be something that you can request and you can um, say, you know, this is the modification that I want um, would be this. So I would see that it's a pretty reasonable uh, modification request. I also see another question. Um, can we clarify that an ESA is not the same as a service dog and a service dog is protected under a different law? Yes, absolutely. Um, that is correct. That an ESA is not the same as a service dog and is protected under a different law. Let's see if um, we'll go ahead and we will talk about this and then maybe go back to my other scenario. Um, because assistance animals are not pets. Um, assistance animals includes service dogs and emotional support therapy and comfort dogs. Now these are very different. Um, a service animal is protected under the ADA. So that means a service animal is performing a specific task and a service animal also can be, um, in a place such as a movie theater or a library. Um, probably not right now during COVID, however, um, they would be able to, uh, they would be protected under the ADA and they would be um, allowed to go to. Um, They're still protected even during COVID, just so you know. Yes, um, yeah. So they can go to the grocery store, any, any place that's open, um, yes. but not like say a tiger enclosure at the zoo. Yes, yes. So you don't want them near the tigers. So there yes. are certain restrictions on zoos and like aquariums and places like that. But for the most part, if it's a service dog, it can go in. Absolutely. Sorry. I was talking about how most movie theaters are closed now. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yes. So you probably couldn't go into a movie theater unless it was open during COVID-19. They were following COVID-19 protocols. And then you absolutely can bring your service animal into that movie theater. Now, the difference is an emotional support animal. If you have an emotional support animal, emotional support animals are protected under fair housing laws because they provide that full enjoyment of the dwelling. 
Um, so they are primarily for um, the home, the emotional comfort, um, and um, and please don't uh, bring your emotional support animal into the public. <laughs> that is that is correct. Don't do that. Uh, so service animals, you know, I always say it like this, service animals are trained to perform a particular service. Emotional support animals, comfort animals, therapy animals may not be uh, trained. Some are trained to perform a certain function, but some are not trained to perform a certain function. And so by bringing an emotional support animal, um, totally different from a service animal um, and does not have those same protections. So I said, I see another um, comment in the chat pertaining um, and task trained for an individual. Yes, yeah, so service animals are task trained. They perform that service. They can also go into places like grocery stores, emotional support animals, not so much. Oh, just, um, just to clarify, if you have a service dog, you're in a place of business and that service dog is not under control, they're well within their rights to ask you to leave. Um, but only if the dog is out of control, like if it's barking with no purpose. Mm -hmm. No, some, some, I'm sorry, somebody just asked something in the chat and I don't know if you know the answer to that, but it's no. <laughs> So does one need proof of being a service animal? Um, it's the way they act, that's your proof. So yeah, so you do not need evidence. Um, I know that I see a lot of, uh, and we'll talk about those letters online. Um, so you do not need proof of a service animal. You don't need it to be officially- those are fake. Yeah, you don't need like a specific, um like document to bring with you or anything um rather why i yeah. always say oh i was gonna say to help you out marissa um there a place of business is allowed to ask two things only is it a service dog and is it task trained not what it's for just is it a service dog and is it task trained yes so that's it that's exactly correct and i also want to say that um that similar um, kind of uh, line of questioning also pertains to housing as well. So um, if it is, if you do have a service dog, um, the landlord cannot ask, um, oh, what's the service dog for? You know, what are the tasks that it performs? What's the service that it performs? What does it do? What's your disability? Your landlord, your housing provider cannot ask those kinds of questions. Um, so what they need to know is, um, what, is, of course they need to know, um, if it's emotional support animal or a service animal. Um, so they need to kind of know what it does and they also need, or they need to know what it qualifies under. Um, and they also can ask, um, is it related to your disability? Which is yes. If they need more information from there, um, the landlord then has to go to, um like the landlord can ask for additional information however cannot ask about the nature of the disability and cannot ask about um you know what is it that this specific animal does um so you know what are the specific train tasks that the animal does um so they can ask for additional information um, but they cannot ask about the nature of the disability but as an individual, you're allowed to volunteer that information. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So if you did want to provide them with that information, um, you know, if you do explain, this is my this is my animal, my animal does a specific task, um, the landlord may say, I've, I've seen the animal do that specific task. I don't feel the need to ask for any additional information. Um, however, you know, if they, if they do ask for information, and let's say it is like a seeing eye dog, um, it's probably pretty obvious what that animal does as a service dog. Um, if it proposes that kind of burden on the tenant, on the individual to, you know, if it's 
a, if it's an apparent disability and the landlord is asking additional follow-up questions like that, um, they may just be trying to postpone granting that accommodation, in which case um, you would have a case of discrimination. Marissa, I don't know, it, it, and everyone here, I don't know if Joe said earlier and I missed it, but Joe knows a lot because her family does have a service dog. Mm. Yeah, my son has a service dog and he's actually sitting next to me. Oh, oh look at him. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm really, uh, I prefer presentations to be a back and forth, a dialogue, anything you can um, maybe bring and speak about, you know, that I'm missing or I just haven't spoken on yet, you know, that helps me too. So I, I encourage it. So another scenario, if I have a hearing impairment and as a result, I have a service dog who will alert me if my fire alarm goes off, somebody's at the door. My landlord told me that all service dogs receive a certificate and told me that I have to provide certification to demonstrate my dog is legitimate. Do I have to show the certification? I see a couple shakes of heads. Something no. tells me no. <laughs> yes, exactly right. You do not need to show this certification. Um, you, most certifications are typically found online and typically are not legitimate. Um, so you do not need to show a certification for a service animal. Um, I will say some organizations do have their own certifications. For example, mm -hmm. our, our service dog came from Four Paws for Ability. They have their own certification process um, and they have their own policies on whether or not, like they give the federal law, this is what the federal law is, please educate. And here's the certification. So if you need, so if somebody's asking, their policy is educate and then provide it. Ab absolutely. Um, and I do believe that there are several um, organizations in Kentucky that are, they legitimately train service animals and they do provide, um, you know, certifications through their, through their agencies. Um, however, it's not required. So I always tell individuals, um, you know, if it is a service animal, then it's providing that task. Um, it does not need to be certified. However, if it is certified through a legitimate organization or agency, then excellent. That's great. Um, but it does not need to as long as it is, um, as, as long as it's trained to perform those tasks that relate to an individual's disability. Now, if it's emotional support, a comfort animal, a therapy animal, it's probably not trained to perform certain tasks, to perform certain functions. Um, rather, it's there as a comfort. And in those cases, um, you know, we do not, uh, at least I have not found um, agencies that provide legitimate generic comfort um, because typically uh, agencies that I've seen that allege you know emotional support needs um, are typically online and typically it's like if you pay a hundred dollars then you get a certificate. Oh, I just wanted to say something about that. Um, yeah that is correct. Um, the organization that we went through to get my son service dog uh, they do have, they, they call them fabulous flunkies, they're career changing dogs, and some of them do get placed as emotional support animals, mm -hmm. um, but this particular company, they keep track of every dog that they place, no matter what their placement is. Okay, yeah, and that's, um, that sounds like and they're they, Ohio. okay, they're, they're north. Um, it definitely sounds like that is um, a reputable agency and organization that um, probably chronological, they, they track, you know, here's what the animal can provide um, rather than what we'll talk about in a little bit. Some of those online internet. It's four calls for ability in case you're wanting to okay. 
get more information. And I did um, two presentations on it. So you can find those on our YouTube channel. If you look back before COVID, I did one when we were fundraising and another when we actually got Saul. Thank you for that. I just jotted it down right quick. That way I'd be able to look into it afterwards. Um, so if a landlord does have a pet policy, does not apply to assistance animals, both service animals and emotional support therapy animals. Um, they cannot charge a pet deposit or a pet fee. Um, they cannot restrict a breed. Uh, they, cannot, they can require that the dog is vaccinated or the animal, the cat, whatever it is, is vaccinated. Um, and they can ensure that there are reasonable health and safety concerns. So if it is an emotional support animal, um, something that landlords will ask me is, well, what if the animal is aggressive? I tell them, um, is there documentation or proof of the animal being aggressive? The animal's breed, not enough. There's no evidence of that specific breed being more aggressive because that's not that specific animal. So if you have evidence of that specific animal being aggressive, then you can take appropriate measures to ensure that there is um, the health and safety of your tenants is maintained. However, um, just saying this breed is very aggressive, um, that's not, a, that's not a, a good enough excuse, basically. Um, Marissa, I noticed on your, on your slide here, you have can require licensing. Um, just, I just want to make people aware that there's, there are cities, not, not necessarily states, but cities that do not require licensing necessarily for a service dog mm -hmm. for an ESA is different, but like in Lexington, there's no licensing requirement for service dogs. So like, you don't have to have that pet license because they're right, not so a pet. <laughs> right, so thank you for bringing up that distinction. So with ESAs, um, they do have to have um, the licensing to, you know, ensure that, especially because we see a lot of the time um, that, you know, sometimes pets do become emotional support animals. So in that case, and that can just, you know, be an individual who, um, if they, become depressed and let's say their medical provider um, no longer thinks that med medical, so medicine treatment is um, applicable to treat their depression. However, they do think an emotional support animal um, would be okay to treat their depression. Um, that is how that can kind of shift and change. And um, that's how that treatment, because the animal is considered an emotional support animal to assist with that disability. Um, so that is how that treatment would potentially function. So service and comfort animals. These are two that I've gotten. One was a Facebook ad and the other one was just a website that I was able to go to online. If you see things like this, which is something that we see quite a bit, we've seen it less and less now, but I mean, I have seen quite a bit of them. Um, going online to get approved uh, in this way is something I never recommend because, um, you know, typically these um, therapists that are um, kind of on call, typically the um, treatment that you're receiving is, you know, several minutes long. So it's not part of this long-term treatment plan. Um, it is pretty much based upon money. So if you pay the $100, you automatically get um, a certificate saying that they're in ESA. You get the letter from the therapist that is potentially out of the state saying um, that, yes, Marissa Webb um, has a disability under the Fair Housing Act and she, um, um, she would benefit from her emotional support animal, vaguely. So we tell individuals, you know, that on its face, because of the knowledge that anybody can go online and anybody can be approved this way, 
um, or most anybody can be approved this way. Um, we tell um, landlords, housing providers, that you can ask for potentially a another, um, an, basically another source. So, you know, I'm questioning the legitimacy of waggy.pet because I went online and I was approved for an ESA in under two minutes. So I'm questioning that legitimacy. Um, do you have a primary care physician or somebody else who knows about your disability? Um, so landlords, housing providers can actually ask for that information. And these are some of the ones that I've seen online that I've had cases with. Um, waggy.pet, serviceanimals.org, support pets, therapy pets. Um, I tell individuals it's, it's probably not the best way to go about it because again, your landlord can ask for that additional, uh, they can't ask for that additional information. And HUD has provided guidance about this, uh, documentation from the internet. So um, they've indicated that a landlord, uh, as long as it the, the accommodation is not obvious or otherwise known, they can ask for um, reliable information and websites such as waggy.pet are not in itself reliable and legitimate enough to grant that accommodation request. So um, it has to um, indicate that the, the I don't want to say that burden is on the tenant, but the tenant does have to demonstrate um, that their accommodation request is coming from a, um, a reputable, a legitimate source. So they can request documentation of the need, again, only to the extent to verify the disability and the accommodation is needed, but not what the disability is. Um, they cannot require or gather any confidential medical records. Um, and for an ESA, it does not just have to be your primary care physician. It can be from a licensed healthcare provider, um, but it can also be from a disability agency, a clinic, or if it's an emotional support animal, it can also be from somebody who has an intimate knowledge of the disability. So this could be a social worker. This could also be, um, you know, we've seen HUD guidance in the past that has said potentially an AA sponsor, somebody who is trained and has intimate knowledge of the individual the individual's disability and understands how the ESA, that therapy comfort animal, can provide that full enjoyment of the dwelling. So a um, question about ESAs now is if I'm a landlord and I granted an emotional support animal as an accommodation for one of my tenants, but the tenant's lease expired, and they moved out. I saw that the carpet was soiled and smelled because of the, of the ESA. Um, I wanna keep the security deposit to cover the cost of the new carpet. Can I do that? Yes, I'll guess yes. This is another point. Yeah, so that's correct, yes. Um, so because the landlord, and we hear landlords complain about this all the time, what about the carpet? Um, can I charge that additional security deposit because it's a pet? No, it's not a pet, it's an assistance animal. And that's what that security deposit that everybody pays is for. Um, so they can, you can keep that security deposit as long as the cost of the replacement of the carpet is equal to the cost of that security, or the cost of the carpet, same cost as that security deposit. Um, but you cannot charge them potentially more. Now I see a couple of questions in the chat, such as, um, what if the landlord, is it discrimination when the landlord says that they would prefer you didn't get a service dog when you initially mention it? Yes, I would say absolutely. If they say, you say, well, 
um, I think a service animal would really help me in this way. Um, and let's say you are a friend. Yo, oh, oh no. That actually happened to us. And then, and then that particular place also discriminated against my cousin who had an ESA. Oh, was it recent? She moved out. She's deceased now, but oh, she, she moved that. out. And then a, uh, about a year later, she was in a car accident. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear yeah. that. Um, but yes, I, I'm, it sounds to me just based off that question that it would definitely be considered discrimination. Um, if you, if they say, oh, I don't think that you should, uh, what, a, what about the walls? What about my carpet? You know, that's oh, not- Their excuse was other people would see us with a dog and would also want to have pets. And when, because we've heard landlords say that too, what do I say to the family that wants a new puppy for Christmas? And my response to them is, well, you don't explain it because it's an individual with a disability. So you're not supposed right. to disclose that. Um, but you would explain, you know, there are circumstances, it's not a pet. That's all I can really say about that. So that's right. what I tell landlords to say. Now, if they do or don't, you know, My I can only- My personal response oh, is, <laughs> would they want the child with the disability to go along with it? Mm. Because that's what you have to have is, or if it's the particular person, would they want the disability to go with it? <laughs> yeah, um, I, I absolutely, that's how I would respond. That's probably yeah. not how you would respond to somebody for with dealing with Fair Housing Act. But as I, as the mom of a disabled child, that's how that's what I would say. Which which is understandable, of course. I you know I I tell landlords, um, you shouldn't be disclosing who has a disability on your property at all. You should say you know there are circumstances um they it's not a pet that's all i'm i'm willing to disclose right now and unfortunately that's or fortunately then that's how it is they can say it's a service dog mm -hmm. and without disclosing who who's got the disability what the disability mm -hmm. is or anything like that they can just say it's not a pet, it's a service dog, or it's not a pet, it's an emotional support animal. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, I tell, I tell landlords, you know, part of your job is to sometimes act as a mediator for disgruntled tenants, but that doesn't mean that the rights of other tenants are being potentially infringed upon. Um, so I always try to do that um, or tell landlords that I hope that they listen to me and I hope that they um, take it seriously um, because that's what the law is and that's what their job is as a property manager um, is to ensure that they are abiding by the Fair Housing Act. <laughs> All right, so I'm, I'm not quite sure if I went over on time or not, but um, up on the screen is my contact information, including my email, the best way to reach me um, while I am working remotely. Um, but I- You have like 30 minutes left. You're, you're oh. golden. Yeah, you oh, can excellent. talk a well, long time. Then if you have any questions or concerns or perhaps other examples, um, I'm here um, and I would love to chat a little bit more. And if not, then- are they allowed to find an excuse to not renew a lease just because somebody has an emotional support animal? Great question. Great question. So um, let's say it's in the middle of your lease. You get the emotional support animal or service animal. You provide them with the documentation. They don't say anything, but you think that they're a little disgruntled. And then they say, sorry, we're, no, we're not renewing your lease agreement at all. At that point, what I would um, say is that if you think that it's because you got that emotional support animal, um, you should probably follow a complaint of discrimination because what happens is once we receive that information, we've gathered those details from you, 
they didn't tell you why they no, did not want to renew the lease agreement. They just said, we don't want to renew it. Part of our job is to ask them specifically and explicitly, what is the reason for the non-renewal of the lease agreement? Um, by not renewing the lease, you are effectively evicting an individual, even if you're not going through the eviction process. You're making housing otherwise unavailable, which is a violation of the Fair Housing Act. Um, so they would have to provide explicit reason. Now, if they say something such as, you know, we see this a lot, um, they'll say, oh, we want to do renovation work on the property. Then our next question would be, okay, do you have contractors um, already set up? Do you have, have you already done that renovation work? Um, can we see proof of it? Can we see proof of this specific apartment needing to go renovation work? Um, so we do ask for that supplementary information. Once they provide a defense, um, it is our job to determine if that defense is pretext. So if that defense is basically just an excuse um, and the real reason is discrimination. Um, so with, um, with my cousin, I did actually contact you guys. Um, they still found reasons to not renew her lease. Uh, and the, one of the people who worked in the office lived above her and basically har harassed her the whole time she was living there. I'm, I'm so sorry to hear that. It sounds yeah. like the, was the harassment do you think the harassment is primarily based upon getting that ESA? Um, it was. And what's weird about it is that she was forthcoming about the fact that she had an ESA before she moved in. Mm. Yeah. And then they started saying, oh, we want proof that this is an ESA. We want documentation, which they're allowed to ask for. So she's going through all this process of trying to get that documentation. Mm -hmm. And then um, they're their form, and I actually have a copy of it somewhere, their form actually asks a question that isn't allowed. Oh, wow. When, when was this? This was about two years ago. Yeah, about two years ago. Wow. And there was a, what, do you remember what that form was? Um, like, yeah, it was a form what, that, what it that they wanted. Do what? Sorry, what the form asked? Oh yeah, the, the form asked for a, um, a some kind of medical professional to sign off that this is an emotional support animal and that and this is the one that got me, that they would be willing to testify to that in court. And that, that was the question that wasn't allowed. I remember it explicitly. Yeah, that... <laughs> Like you're, you're allowed to ask if it's an emotional support animal, you're allowed to ask a doctor to say it. You're not allowed to ask a doctor to say under perjury of law in a courtroom, I would say the same thing. That's yeah, that's, that's, and I informed them, I informed them that that was not the law, mm -hmm. that, that they weren't even allowed to ask that, but it was their own personal form. And that's what they were requiring of her. They mm -hmm. wouldn't, re they wouldn't accept just her doctor writing a note saying, yes, she has an emotional support animal. This is her emotional support animal. It had to be on their documentation. It had to be on their documentation. That is correct. And she did yeah. everything she could. She submitted her form like three or four different times. And one of those times she finally got the doctor just say, all right, fine. I'll just say yes on that part, even though that question's not allowed. Yeah. And they still found a reason to not renew her lease. Not renew it. Mm -hmm. So what we would, well, what we often see when it is scenarios such as that, um, is that it would potentially be either otherwise making housing unavailable or potentially retaliation. So in retaliation of exercising her fair housing rights, um, in, um, 
in requesting that accommodation and going through that process, um, they then retaliated against her and said, right. Yeah, we're, we're not going to renew your lease. And we did contact you guys when that happened. We didn't talk. She, she was done. She moved out anyway. Okay. Yeah. So we can t definitely talk maybe not when it's on live. Um, yeah. 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 About that for sure. Um, I do know too that when individuals. I was just giving a scenario of, yeah. you know, this is a, this is a thing that can happen and yeah, it's definitely good to contact you guys. Right. So something that we, we definitely see a lot right, is housing providers say this can't be retaliation because, um, you know, either they didn't request the accommodation or we granted the accommodation even if it took, you know, three, six months to do it. Um, we have documentation of what all happened. And so something that we, we definitely say is that, like, um, you know, if you file a complaint with us, then if that's kind of the, the I don't want to say the start date, but that is the date that we can say, well, they definitely exercise their fair housing, right? Um, you know, it doesn't matter potentially what the respondent, what the landlord says, um, because we know going through our process is covered by the Fair Housing Act. Um, so we try to tell individuals that, um, too, because I know that we definitely see a lot of landlords that will, or housing providers that will say, well, they didn't really engage in the Fair Housing Act. They didn't really exercise their fair housing rights, um, right. even, even if individuals do. Right. So I'm not sure, like, what, um, what all was said, uh, but I, I do know that when I did make contact um, my cousin, she gave me permission to help her. Um, but I don't, I don't know what the results, what the end result of that was other than they found a reason to, to, um, not renew her lease. Yeah, we, um, we call that pretext basically when they come up with a reason, um, mm -hmm. to not renew it. Um, and in cases of discrimination and civil rights cases of discrimination, um, it's kind of like a, like a tennis match potentially where first the burden is on the, um, individual bringing forth the complaint. They have to demonstrate that they are covered under the fair housing act. They have to demonstrate the harm was done. They have to demonstrate that, um, it, was potentially a violation of the Fair Housing Act, but then um, that burden shifts to the respondent. So now the respondent has to explain a reason. Um, then that burden shifts to back to the tenant, the individual. Um, they have to demonstrate and show that the reason given was pretext, that it was actually just an excuse and that the real reason is still discrimination. Now, individuals going through our process, they're not having to just do that, you know, all by themselves. That's what we're here as that fact-finding agency to get that supplementary information from the respondent and from the complainant, you know, that kind of documentation. Mm -hmm. I am very sorry to hear um, uh, about your cousin though. Yeah, I'm purposely very not exciting. saying names, so. Because I know that we are on live, but yeah, we can definitely chat about it. Um, but yeah, I was yeah. just giving an example of the, you know, this is a thing that can happen with mm -hmm. that. Um, and, you know, even though we were bringing in a definitely legitimate service dog from a definitely legitimate company, we were still told at first we would prefer you didn't get a service dog. And then later, you know, of course, I knew what, what our rights were. So um, I just went ahead and started the process anyway. And then once we brought Saul home, there was really nothing they could say about it. 
although somebody did complain about him one day um they said we weren't picking up after him because i forgot the i forgot the poo bags and i had to go back downstairs and i spent like 20 minutes looking for looking for the spot when we first got him but we always cleaned up uh, as somebody who has an animal i've also been in a situation where i was like oh no i forgot a poo bag mm -hmm. and then had to go back and try and find yeah so um i actually wrote about it on my blog it was hilarious <laughs> Are there any other questions or anything for me? Um, let me check the Facebook Live. Uh, I, I have a question. Like, how do they determine, like, can you have there's like gerbils and rabbits and all different kinds of animals? Is there like a listing of the types of animals that could be a support animal? Great, great question. Um, so service animals are limited to dogs and ponies, um, miniature ponies. Um, emotional support animals, comfort animals, um, not so much. I could have an emotional comfort snake and that could be considered an ESA. Um, you know, if I can demonstrate that I have a disability and an individual with intimate knowledge of my disability says, you know, if feeding the snake and in ensuring that the snake is habitable in her apartment, um, in her home, um, provides her comfort, it gives her a routine, it really helps with my disability, with my depression, um, then it can be considered an emotional support animal. Um, so there really is not a specific, you know, has to be a dog, unless, like I said, it's a service animal, performing a certain duty, it falls into those two categories. This Otherwise, is why somebody brought a peacock to the airport and said, that's my emotional support animal. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, we haven't seen any of those in Lexington. Um, we mostly, have, I've mostly dealt with cats and dogs as emotional support animals. But if an individual can show and explain, you know, maybe they have an allergy potentially. And so, their emotional support snake is the thing that gives them comfort and does allow them to have that full enjoyment of the dwelling, then it's an emotional support snake. My husband bought three gerbils for that. Well, not, not as, I don't know. He, he bought them for comfort, so. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and the weird thing about what happened at this particular place that I discussed earlier is somebody had a bird. Um, and there was, there was another person who had a little dog and the little dog was not a service dog and not an ESA. Wow. Yeah. They didn't even try to justify that? Yeah um the the people who had the pet dog did not did not let the landlords know ahead of time they oh. did it. um and then there was an another lady who had a cat but she let them know ahead of time mm. and so for some people they would allow them to have a pet and charge them a pet deposit but then when it came to ESAs, you know, they're not getting a pet deposit because it's an ESA. And with service animals, same thing. No pet deposit because it's a service animal. It's not a pet. So I don't know if that was their deal or what, but it actually said in, in my lease, agreement at the time it said no pets mm. so i guess it was luck of the draw however they were feeling that day yeah. whether or not there was going to be a pet allowed and their uh their advertisements always say no pets allowed 
Mm -hmm. It sounds like potentially poor management was a, a real factor. <laughs> but their maintenance people were great. So does anybody else have anything to add or any questions? I don't see anything on Facebook. Okay. All right. Well, Marissa, like I said earlier, I'm just so, I thought it was a great presentation. I'm really psyched at how much ground you covered and I'm kicking myself for uh, having limited the title of tonight's talk. I, it was great. Oh, no, no problem at all. I, I definitely think with um, an issue such as service animals, emotional support animals, having that broader knowledge of what all the Fair Housing Act can cover um, and just disability under the Fair Housing Act is uh, really helpful as well. So um, even if it was just on ESA, emotional support animals, I probably would have also tried my best to cover um, disability as well, just generic disability modifications, the extent of reasonable accommodations, um, just because if um, it doesn't help you all directly, then perhaps an, an individual, it can help somebody else. Um, and now uh, you have the knowledge. So, or if, um, if not, then you at least know who to point to and you can certainly direct them to our office. We try to, with both tenants and individuals looking for housing and landlords and housing providers, we always tell them, please come and talk to us first because otherwise you'll have, be receiving a potential charge of discrimination, which is less fun. Yeah, yeah, it's to their benefit. And the Human Rights Commission for Fayette County, they, they do like, Marissa and the other folks that are investigators, they do an excellent job. We really are blessed to have them. Well, thank you. Yeah, that, I mean, that is great. And I definitely want to talk to you about that particular um, location, um, just because more than likely they're still doing that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Please. They've been there since the 70s. Yeah, yeah so. Um, they probably have not changed their practice potentially. Um, definitely reach out to me, I encourage you to. And something that um, you know, we can always initiate a commissioner complaint. So potentially if a lot of individuals are involved um, and none of them wanna be named, they all wanna remain anonymous, um, then the commission, commissioner can file a complaint on their behalf. Um, but also if it is potentially, you know, if we get a copy of um, their documentation, they're still doing the same stuff that they were doing, um, they're still potentially violating the law, then that can also initiate a commissioner complaint. Because even though we can't name an, an, a specific individual who is bringing forth the complaint, who is harmed, um, it because the uh, because the practice is ongoing, then we can just initiate the complaint on behalf of the commission. And if somebody wants to know what that place is, you can private message me on Facebook. Because I won't say it on live, sorry. <laughs> well, thank you so much for letting me present today. Um, and um, thank you for your participation, for speaking with me about it. Um, I really appreciate it. Oh, it was a great presentation. We well, are so glad to have you. Yeah, yeah. And like Mel said, just glad to have you guys here in Fayette County. We're thank lucky. You. Yeah, well, thank you. And you, um, everyone here is welcome back to any of our meetings anytime. And uh, I should, um, let you all know what our next couple of meetings are. Our, our March meeting, which will be on March 29th, will feature Dr. Caitlin Allen. She'll be speaking on executive function and, a, and uh, autism spectrum disorder. And April meeting will be April 26th with Dr. Paul Wayman of Virginia Commonwealth University on employment and people with significant support needs. 
Um, the executive dysfunction one would be really interesting for ADHD folks as well. Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. So if you, if any of you out there listening right now knows of anyone who might be interested in either of those meetings, please pass it along. Um, but um, that's the uh, March meeting on executive function and on a, our April meeting on employment and people with significant support needs. Then we're also sometime in the summer going to have uh, Dr. Myra Beth Bundy on obtaining an autism diagnosis in adulthood. Not the easiest, it's not the easiest thing to do to find um, specialists who will diagnose adults or much more used to diagnosing children. Um, and uh, if anyone wants to not receive the, um, the flyers by mail, just let any of us know, let me know or, uh, or Joe know. Um, and, yeah, uh, you we'll can always text list. me and I'll take you off the list. Um, yeah. My text number, my um, phone number is on the bottom of the flyer for that. And I'll just take it off the list and, and let whomever is sending out those flyers at the moment no, and that will be Sarah at the moment. Yeah, no, a lot of people are uh, trying to pair back on their mail, so we can help you with that. That'd be, that'd be okay by us. So I don't know if there's uh, any other, uh, Melanie, if you know of any other announcements that we need to put out there while we're still recording. I can't think of it? any, uh, only that, um, no, I can't think of any, sorry. Okay. No, it's good, that's good. I, I didn't think there were, so, all right. Oh, she might have been actually about to say that we don't have a meeting in May because of Memorial Day. So you, you mentioned March and April, right? And then in May, we don't have a, a meeting. Is the new website live? Um, yes, the new website is live. It's not completely updated yet, but it is live. So awesome. I, we, we are still working on getting all of the updates in place. Everyone, that's asbg.org. Pass it along to anybody who might need to access any of our information or our contact information, asbg.org. Thanks a lot, Joe, for working on that too. Joe has been working really hard on getting the website yes. and, updated. And Vlad has been super duper helpful. So, um, so yeah. yeah. He, it's been, it's been great. Awesome. Okay, I'll bring this meeting to an official close so that everybody who wants to, Marissa, you can go eat now. <laughs> thanks a lot for taking your dinner time and talking to us. And Allie, thanks a lot for letting us know about Justin's. That was really great information about that. So if you have anything else that you need us, both of you, if you guys ever have any announcements that would be appropriate to our group, let us know. We can put them out there to our listserv. Our listserv is pretty large. Um, and you can pop in on these meetings at the beginnings of them. Oh yeah, always. Yeah, even if you even if you don't let us know in advance, if you just have a little announcement to make, just jump in at the beginning of our meetings and uh, you can introduce yourself and make your announcement and that'd be fine. Um, but we have about eight, 800 members on our listserv. So um, if you have announcements to make, if you have anything you want to put out there, Allie, if you have a flyer for Justin's place, and we can put that out to the listserv. So yeah, let us know if you have any special events or anything like that. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, everyone, I guess that's it for tonight. Um, please remember to join us next month for our March meeting. We meet the last Monday of almost every month. Um, so we'll see you next month, the last Monday of March. Have a good night.